Please be seated. The New Testament lesson is from Peter, 1 Peter, verses 5 through 9. Listen now to the word of God. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness, and goodness with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For anyone who lacks these things is short-sighted and blind and is forgetful of the cleansing of past sins. This is the word of the Lord. I have found a great recipe for bread that I've been using lately. Uh, the thing I like about it is it's so simple. Just whole wheat flour, honey oil, water, yeast, a hint of salt, no sugar added, and it only takes a, a couple of hours. And I love that recipe. I, I, I think everybody who comes into my house loves that recipe as well. There was a time in my life when I cooked all sorts of complicated recipes, but today, I really like those simple recipes to use, and the simpler, the better. Peter gives us a recipe for Christian living, and he gives us a pretty simple recipe. Only seven ingredients, goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, mutual affection, love. Now, one of the things I've learned about cooking is that there are many recipes in which you have to add the ingredients in a certain order. With this bread recipe, for example, you've got to start with warm water, add the yeast, add the honey, and then you let it set for a while until the yeast proofs and it begins to bubble up a little bit. And you don't add anything else until then. Now, in Christianity, when you listen to Paul's, or rather Peter's, list, you're attention may go to the very last one, the ingredient of love. Because you know, that's the most important ingredient of all in being a Christian. But that's not what Peter's recipe says. He says, start with the simpler things of the recipe. Because look, you and I both know, <laughs> you don't love everybody the way you should. None of us do. Love is hard. Now we can love our children after they've finished being teenagers, that is. We can love our grandchildren. But we are called as Christians to love everyone. Do you really love the neighbor down the street who plays the music too loud, who never cuts his grass, walks his dog on your yard and never cleans up afterwards? Do you really love that guy? Do you love the guy at work who gossips and spreads slander about everybody, including you? And, and do you really love your boss? Well, the strangers in the parking lot who come out of nowhere and they frighten you for a minute. They're asking for a handout. And what about your enemies or our nation's enemies? Do you love them? Sometimes you have a hard time loving your own family. Love is hard work. And Peter says, start with goodness. Emotion is hard to control, so start with behavior, which you can control most of the time. And then you add on top of that, he says, the ingredient of knowledge. Get to know God. Get to know Jesus. Get to know the people around you. And then you add the ingredient of self-control and then endurance and on down the list until you come to mutual love, loving the people who are trying to love you back. And then the last one, love, the hardest one. Jesus said on the Sermon of the Mount, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for them. And he makes it sound easy, but we know, and Jesus knew, it's not easy. So you start with mutual love and you build that skill, and you really start even earlier than that in Peter's list. Just start by trying to be good to people. Smile at people. Call your waiter by name and thank them. 
treat everyone the way you want to be treated. The people you encounter every day may deal with a dozen different people every hour, and you may be the only one to treat them with goodness. You want to be that person. A while back, I had the opportunity to speak to someone who was celebrating her 100th birthday. And she told me what it was like growing up. She and her family lived on a 40-acre farm with no phones, no lights, no motor cars, not a single luxury. Some of you watch too many old reruns of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> Quote from the theme song. With all the changes she had seen, I asked her, what was the single most significant change you've seen in your lifetime? Was it smartphones, uh, space travel, medical discoveries, having a thousand channels on your television and still not having anything to watch except reruns of Gilligan's Island? Her answer? People. People was, that was the most significant change. She said, the most significant change I've seen in the world is people. They just don't care the way they used to care. She went on to describe how her family, even though they lived on a 40-acre farm, they knew their neighbors, and when one neighbor was in need, the other neighbors would show up to help. When one of the fathers was sick and couldn't do the chores around the farm, the other neighbors would show up and make sure that his chores got done as well as their own. Everybody would pitch in. The whole world has changed, and, and we are the ones who have changed it, not the smartphones, not the technology. Everything we deal with in this world is due to goodness or the lack of it. When you boil down all the fights, arguments, wars, terrors, tragedies, we always come to the same conclusion. Humanity has lost its sense of goodness. Which means ultimately, if we want to improve the world, we have to become the change we want to see in the world. We have to practice goodness to, to others. Peter lists seven recipes or ingredients in this recipe for Christian living. Ultimately, what we're cooking up is a life of love. And loving our neighbor, our stranger, our enemies, it all starts with learning how to be good to other people. That's the first ingredient. Start right there. You start there, and the change you want to see, that's the change that takes place in you. Immanuel Kant was a central figure in modern philosophy. He wrote a book of ethics and moral behavior, which he appropriately titled Groundwork. And the very first sentence, very first sentence of the book, he says, the only thing that is unconditionally good is one's goodwill. And he argues that the things we think that might be good in our life may or may not be good, things like health and wealth and beauty and intelligence. In some situation, any of those things could be bad. Wealth is good, but if you misuse it, you become corrupted by wealth. Uh, health is good but you could use it to overpower and bully other people. Uh, beauty may lead a person to vanity. Even happiness is not good. If in your character you are a sadistic person and you find pleasure in hurting other people, the only good in us is our goodwill. And what, is exact, what do, exactly does that mean? It, it means that a person acts from a good will because they know they have a sense of duty to someone beyond themselves, to their neighbor, and ultimately to God, to Christ. And that's what Peter's trying to get at. The first ingredient in this recipe for Christian living is goodness. The goodness that comes from a sense of duty to Christ and to others. Kant also said that the way we act changes the world around us. If we act mean, that meanness permeates the people around us, and they, they become mean. 
if we act good, that goodness invites other people to be good as well. You can see it on I-4 every day. A mean driver makes us mean in return. I'm not going to let him be cut off without cutting him off as well. We need to be the change in what we want the world to be. Jesus taught his followers that they should respond to people who hurt them in this way. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other as well. In other words, be good to other people. Do unto others, he said, as you would have them to do unto you. And that's hard. I know it is. And in Peter, the kind of love that he puts as the last ingredient, how do you reach that point of loving your, your enemies as well as loving the people who love you back? You go with simple steps, and you start with goodness, knowledge, self-control, mutual love, build on up, but start with goodness. The best definition of that is do to others the way you want them to do to you. I don't know. I, I may be the only one here like this. But lately I've gotten fed up with Congress and politics. Are y'all that way? We have developed into this tribalism of Republican and Democrats, and nothing gets done because the two parties can't work with any with each other anymore we're so divided in this country and you can change that and I'm not just talking about voting although that's a, a great thing I encourage that and, and not just by running for a public office yourself uh, no pastor would dare curse a church member with that kind of encouragement <laughs> although it would be good to have a few more Christians in politics you change it by the way we talk about other people. I've heard even people in this church say the most hurtful and unkind things to the people of the other political party. And I've seen posts on social media uh, about people posting things about the other political party that are not true. And that's a violation of the Ten Commandments when it says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. We're just so angry with each other. Whenever a person on the Republican side says the Democrats are evil, or whenever the Democrats say the Republicans are evil, they perpetuate the very thing that we are hating about Congress. When we do that, we make this division in our country possible. And we're all Americans, and we need to return civility to our politics, and that will only start with us starting to talk kindly and civil about the person on the other side. We can be the change in the country. You don't like it when someone talks bad about you? Well, don't talk bad about other people. You don't like it when someone cuts you off on the interstate? Well, don't cut other people off. Just give them some room. Grin and bear it and put up with it. Do unto others. The way you would have others do to you. That's the definition of goodness. You may not love what the other political party is doing. You may not like being cut off in traffic. But treat them with goodness. And eventually, who knows, you might even begin to love them. And love is hard. And that's why Peter starts with goodness. Love is an emotion. Goodness, well, that's a behavior we can perhaps more easily change that first. And the power to change our world is in each one of us. Every day we're either part of the problem or the solution, and I challenge you to be part of the solution. And it doesn't come easy. Everything that I tell you to do as Christians, I think, I often say it takes practice. Practice. You don't get it overnight. I am a Star Trek fan. And on Star Trek, on the starships, someone gets hungry, they walk to a wall, and they say, computer, 
tea. Earl Grey, hot, and a door opens, and there's a little cup of tea. Or they say, chicken soup, and out comes chicken soup and all that. Well, you don't cook like that in real life. It takes ingredients, and you got to put them together. And that's not the way the Christian life goes. You can't walk up to the altar and say, Lord, make me a Christian, loving and kind. He's given us the tools. We just need to practice them, practice them, practice them. I have a niece who about a year ago decided she was going to get into good physical condition. And so she thought, well, push-ups are easy. Don't need to join a gym, no special equipment. You just lay on the ground and push and see how many times she wondered how many push-ups she could do. <laughs> One. One. But she didn't get discouraged. So every day she was doing this. Two, five, ten. A year later, she's in the 90s. She's making progress. And she's going to the gym and running and doing other things as well. She didn't do 90 or so push-ups the very first day. It took practice. So you go out there and you practice goodness. And it may be hard, but you practice. And every day you find that that goodness becomes part of your nature. And then you go back to the whole in recipe of kindness and self-control and mutual love and love and eventually we don't become Christian uh, perfect Christians overnight we'll find that perfection in death but we'll find ourselves maturing and growing in Christ with practice and now unto God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be ascribed by all might, power, dominion, and glory, today and forever. Amen.